Well, thanks, Grant, and uh, good morning, 945 service. I am elated to be with you here this morning. I'm excited about this Parent Trap series. I really enjoy getting to put these messages together for you. And uh, this second week, I've got some good stuff for you. Um, last week, I think, was a clever service. It was clever. This week is practical. This week, we're getting into the nitty-gritty. This is a note sheet kind of week. This is the kind of week you gotta get out a pen and piece of paper, because the second half of the service, I'm gonna give you a fire hose worth of information and tips and tricks regarding parenting. So I'm just telling you right now, get ready, it's coming. Look at your neighbor and say, are you ready for a parenting protein shake? That's right, it's coming. Last week, we talked about the phases of parenting. And uh, we said most kids, or most parents, raise their kids by passing through the three stages of parenting, which is the commander, coaching, and consultant phases. That's what we do as parents. Our goal is to raise kids who become independent, right? The, the commander, coach, and consultant, the kids need the parents progressively less and less. But Jesus teaches us that that goal is not complete. He says in Matthew 19, 14, don't let the little children come to me and don't stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these little children. When you read that like part, I mean, what does it even mean by that? What do you mean like these little children? Jesus, we're not supposed to be like children. We're supposed to be like adults. But Jesus was serious. He wants us to be dependent on him like a child upon her father. What we learned was the spiritual growth process is actually the reverse of the child maturity process. You see, most of us, we start off with God as a consultant. God, you know, you'll come into my life if I want you, but don't tread on me. I'll, I'll ask you, Right? And then God becomes a coach. We come to God on the sideline of Sunday morning. And finally, God becomes a commander, somebody who's a part of every area of our lives. That's a spiritual growth process. And we learn that these two different processes fit together as one unified process. Our goal as parents is not to raise independent children, but to pass the baton of dependence from ourselves to Christ. That's what we want. We want kids who become dependent on Christ in every area of their life as we um, hand that baton off. And I think what happens for a lot of us is our life sort of looks like this. Okay? Many of us were raised with religion in our background, with God sort of in our background. But over the course of time, what kind of happens is eventually that phases out. You know, we do the Christmas, Easter only thing, and eventually, you know, God really isn't a part of our life. And we end up with this God-shaped hole right here in this specific area. And, uh, you know, we try to fill this hole with lots of different things, you know, success, influence, highs, connections, friends, whatever. And the problem is this doesn't satisfy, does it? The only thing that can fill this hole in our hearts is Jesus and uh, last week, we got to see a lot of you choose to follow Jesus as your leader and forgiver. I want you to understand, I think true satisfaction and completeness comes from Christ in our life as commander. This week, I want to give you keys to walking through the specific roles that you'll play in this process. Practical, helpful, and uh, I want to start by asking you a question. Have you ever had a job that you hated? It's surprising to me how many people hate their jobs, you know, and it, I know that's why they call it work, because it's work, not play. But I've always been able to at least choose to enjoy most of what I do. I really only ever had one job that I, I really hated. And I love my work now. I got a great job. But most people I meet, they don't like their work very much, pretty much ambivalent towards it. What's interesting to me as a pastor when I give counsel is uh, I find a, a lot of people who pretty much do the same thing, but they work for different organizations. And I've met some people um, who work for a specific organization. It's like everybody who works there really loves their job. I mean, they really enjoy it. They like it, it's good, they feel satisfied, content being a part of that organization. And then I met a bunch of people who work for a different organization, and what I found is everybody who works for this different organization, even though they do the same thing, they hate it. I like everybody is like miserable there, they want to get out of there. I mean, they, they just hate it. And what I realize is the quality of leadership has a huge impact on employee satisfaction. I mean, it's a big deal. Now, the one job that I've had that I really hated, it was a church, sort of, but it was really more of a country club. It was like a connection business center where people, like, networked with a sort of sermon theme in the background. And, and the biggest thing with this country club was there was just no vision. I mean, people thought it was about, you know, helping longtime families be happy. Still, other people thought it was about fulfilling the great commission that Jesus gives us in the Bible. Still, others thought it was, you know, a place to come and work and get awesome pay and benefits. And I was like, why would you ever think that that would happen in ministry? Like, you entered the wrong field. But anyway, um, what's interesting to me was the infighting with the staff members. I mean, everybody was fighting all the time. Have you ever been a part of an organization? You walk in, and, like, the drama is just there from the second you walk in the door. It's like, ugh, 
Lots of finger pointing. Lots of people trying to take charge. Lots of people digging down and entrenching themselves within their department, siloing, fighting for budget. It was humorous, but it was also really sad to be a part of. And let me be clear. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I hated going to that place. And I'm a pretty positive person, or I can choose to love what I'm doing. I mean, I hate it. I remember pulling up to the parking lot, and as soon as I'd open up my door, I vividly remember the whir of the HVAC um, you know, machines on the top of that building. I could hear them. I remember the frequency. I hated the smell of that building. I hated the sound of the door opening. I hated the clop, clop, clop as my feet, up, uh, as my feet went down the ramp to my desk. I hated every single part of it. Work was miserable. I dreaded it. And everybody was miserable there. The bosses were miserable. The lower level employees were miserable. The overall organization was suffering because we had really bad leadership. Roles were not defined. Nobody wants to go into work and fail. It doesn't matter what you do. You don't want to go in and see the organization and company that you're working to build losing. But we didn't even know what winning looked like. Like, we couldn't even define it. We had no idea what it would look like to win. We just went in and felt like we failed every day. Now, I remember the joy of switching to a new job. Eventually, I took a new job in Minnesota across the country, and there was like a week break in between the jobs. Nothing changed in me as a human being. I went from one miserable job to another job, but all of a sudden, I loved going to work. I mean, every part of it, it was totally different. The culture was different. The staff loved each other. We were unified around a clearly defined win. We knew what winning was. And even if we weren't winning, we knew how we could correct and get back to a place of victory. I think almost all of work enjoyment is rooted in the quality of leadership. And I have seen great leaders take terrible people and turn them into greatness through their inspirational power as a leader. I've also seen Bad leaders take amazing people and inspire them to be terrible, right? We've seen both of these things. I think most leaders, most leaders underestimate their influence. I've experienced this a lot. Um, I was joking with a friend of mine earlier this week. I think the position of weak leadership is shoulder shrugged and palms up. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. I see it oh, all the time. It's not my fault. You know, there's all these external factors that make it not my fault. It's the economy. It's millennials. Millennials. How can I labor? I can't. They won't even. It's just the worst. Blah, blah, blah. It's like you sound like a millennial talking about millennials right now, right? You're trying to blame and control other people and remove responsibility from yourself. And it's like, are you crazy? You are responsible for the organization, and you're trying to remove yourself from responsibility. You see, strong leaders, they don't act like that. They say, I'm going to find a way where there is no way. I mean, we're moving forward, and if there's not a trail, if there's not a path, if there's not a road, and this is a dead end, I'm buying a chainsaw, and we're going to make a trail. We're going to blaze a trail through these woods here. That's what they do. And they don't control other people. They don't blame other people. They inspire, equip, and empower. Have you ever worked for a leader like that? It is awesome. I would even call it life-changing. Because not only do you accomplish great things together, which is fun. I mean, it's fun to, to, to succeed as an organization. But you as an individual receive a lifelong permanent upgrade. You as a person get upgraded because of the way they develop you. I mean, I received this. When I moved from, from Dallas to Minnesota, I took a 60% pay cut. And I wasn't paid that great in Dallas. I lived way below the poverty line when I moved to Minnesota, like impoverished, rice and beans only kind of diet, lost weight. Um, but, but I loved it. And it was probably one of the best socioeconomic decisions I made because so much of the skills and abilities that I have today were specifically because of the first two years of that experience then. It was a great decision that changed my life. Now, here's a secret about leaders in any organization. I think a lot of us, if we have a bad boss or bad organization that we work for, I want you to know your boss hates coming to work as much as you do. A lot of times we, you know, imagine them like she's sitting in her office just counting her money and swimming in a pool of gold coins like Scrooge McDuck, you know? And it's like, no, 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 no. They hate it as much as you do because they know that it's not working right. Here's the other secret. Good leaders also carry a burden, an urgency, because the best leaders realize that it's all their fault if the organization isn't succeeding, that they are the lid to the organization. That's a burden of leadership. That's what it is. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of you right now who are thinking of bad bosses that you have at work, and you're like, oh, I'm so frustrated and unequipped. Work is not a fun place. It makes me mad at their inaction. But I got a question for you. Have you ever felt the same way about going to a horrible workplace as you do coming home? Have you ever opened up the door of your car, and you hear the sound of the garage door, and you're like, ugh. And you hear the sound of the HVAC units in your house, and you're like, ugh, and the smell, and the mess, and the stress, and the spouse, and the kids screaming behind the door, and you're like, ugh. It's funny, because some of you right now are probably saying, but Jen, it's not my fault. 
Palms up, shoulders shrugged. It's not my fault. There are external factors. My wife's just lazy and well, my kids and finances and, you know, the economy. There's never been a better economy. I mean, it's a good time right now. If you can't make it in 2018, I'll tell you what. It's not my fault. Listen, it's interesting to me because we're so quick to rip into leaders at work. But in our chief place of leadership at home, we're hypocritically oftentimes just as bad. We bring a lack of vision. We bring a tendency to blame others and a victim helpless mentality. Oh, woe is me. I was never coddled as a child. It's just so hard and blah, blah, blah. Listen, maybe we don't hate it all the time. But at home, we definitely feel the burden of leadership. Because here's a unique part about home. A lot of you would say, well, John, I'm not a natural leader. You don't understand. I'm just not a natural leader. Every single human being is a leader in one place, and that is at home. You are in charge of pushing the organization of your own life forward. And at home, you are a leader. And if you are not succeeding, guess what? You are the leader, and you are the one who bears the burden and responsibility of leadership in your home organization. This week, I want to talk specifically about how to be a great parent. And last week, we talked about the three distinct roles of parenting. What do commander, coach, and consultant all have in common? They're just all different kinds of leadership. That's all they are. I think a lot of people look at parenting as some big mystery. They're like, oh, you know, I mean, I need tips and tricks. I mean, parenting, there's a secret code. There's a secret code. There's no secret code behind parenting. Parenting is just leadership of little people as they grow into big people. I think the reason why a lot of people struggle to parent isn't because there's a secret behind parenting. It's because you're struggling to bear the burden of leadership. Here's another big secret for leadership. Leadership is not a natural trait. It's a skill you must have the courage to develop. It's like swinging a golf club. I mean, the first time you swing a golf club, it's like super awkward and I don't even know what to do with this. But the more you do it, even if you've never done it, even if you're a terrible golfer, you will become better the more you do it. It's a skill you develop. Same is true for leadership. And fortunately for Christians, I think we have the greatest leader of all time to follow. No person in history has done so much starting with little, so little. No other name is better known in the world. And as a matter of historical fact, no other human has done more good for the human endeavor in history than the person of Jesus of Nazareth. I think he's a pretty good example of what leadership is. So what I want to do is I want to look at the foundation of leadership that he lays. There's a passage in the Bible where he really defines what good leadership is. He looks at his team and he says, this is good leadership. It's John chapter 10, verses 9 through 14. We're actually going to go through it verse by verse. And uh, there's four principles that he hides in here that talk about what good leadership is. I'd encourage you to turn there in your Bibles. Some of your Bibles are glowing. That's fine. Some of you have the old-fashioned analog Bibles. To me, a book is like a record player. It's like, what's that? What are these pages that I have to turn with my fingers, you know? But whatever. Whatever you got, go ahead and turn there. I want to look at Jesus' four principles of leadership. Starting in verse 10, it says, The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy, but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And what Jesus is doing right off the bat here is he's showing us the first step of leadership, which is to define the win. Great leaders define what winning is because you can't work hard until you know what you're working towards. How can you get somewhere if you don't know where there is, right? You have to define the win. Then he goes on and he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. And this is so incredibly seminal. Jesus is creating a whole new idea surrounding leadership. In the Greco-Roman world, nobody led by laying down their life or sacrificing. Everybody dominated, destroyed, took, captured, and plundered. That was the way that you led in the Greco-Roman world. Today, we all know that good leaders lead by example. And that is, that's like, that's crazy back then. You see, Jesus invented this whole concept. Concept. And it's like, <laughs> I love that 2,000 years later, Simon Sinek thinks that he like, has the corner on, on the market of, of sacrificial leadership. It's like, no, no, no. Jesus came up with that 2,000 years ago in your best-selling book, Leaders Eat Last. You just ripped off Jesus. You know, Dale Carnegie, Seven Habits, whatever. All these guys just ripped off Jesus. Leaders who are self-sacrificing and who lead by example are the most inspiring. He goes on in verse 12. He goes, a hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. This is my favorite point that he makes. Jesus says leaders take ownership. Have you ever had an employee that's just in it for the money? Ugh, it's just the worst, right? There's such a big difference between an ownership mentality and a hired hand mentality. A lot of times you walk into a fast food place, you know, and you just see that one person. I mean, they are just going hard, right? They're doing everything. They're they're getting extra credit. They're sweating. They're working. They're picking stuff up. And you see that person. A lot of times I'll ask, do you own this restaurant? And most of the time, the answer I get in return is yes. You can see what an ownership mentality actually looks like. That's why at First Church, we don't have members. We have owners. 
I love that so many of you have embraced an ownership mentality of what God is doing here. We have the smallest staff to attend a ratio. We have a smaller staff than any church I know of in this state, in the state of Indiana. There's no church I know of that has more attenders, smaller staff. You know why we're able to operate that way with so few staff on such a tiny, teeny budget? Is because we have you guys who say, you know what, I have an ownership mentality. And you know what? Paper towels on the floor and trash in the parking lot, that's not somebody else's problem. That's my problem because I own this house, right? I'm taking care of it. I'm so proud to be a part of a church of owners. It says in verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I'm, uh, I know my own sheep and they know me. Just as my father knows me and I know my father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. And then verse 9, he says, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They come and go freely and they will find good pastures. What he's doing here is he's laying out the vision, and then he's empowering us, inspiring us to walk down that road and giving us feedback about what that looks like. And this is the last step of leadership. Leaders don't force people to follow them in Jesus' model of leadership. They don't demand it. They don't say, do this or else. They say, hey, I want to light the way and clear the path. They inspire, and that's great, but I also think it's the most technical part of leadership. It requires us to summon energy after a long day. It requires us to have focus, courage, and empathy. And most significantly, I think inspirational leadership requires vulnerability and authenticity. One of my favorite mentors, Craig Rochelle, says, people would rather follow a leader who's always real than one who's always right. And this is what the best leaders do. So to summarize, Jesus says great leaders define the win. They lead by example. They take ownership, and they empower with feedback. And uh, what I really want to do right now is I want to take some time to apply these four points to the context of parenting. I want to show you how the, the leadership secrets of Jesus can transform the way that you parent. And even if you don't believe in Jesus, I want you to know the teachings of Jesus can bless your life in a big, big way. So I want to encourage you to lean in and listen up, even if you're not a follower of Jesus. And if you don't have kids, especially, especially if you're a young single 20-something, I can think of no other talk that would have the potential to make your life even better than it is than the stuff I'm going to give you in this one. So you're going to want to lean in and listen and take heavy notes on what I'm going to talk about. But the most important part, the foundation of all leadership is defining the win. Jesus says you've got to define the win. I remember the most frustrating football game I've ever watched in my life. I grew up and was raised in the tundra of Minnesota. They have a ton of snow up there, and I'm like thanking God that I don't live there right now. But um, I grew up as a huge Minnesota Vikings fan. And this is all we have in the winter. I just want to be clear. We have nothing. We just sit in our houses wishing for the two weeks of summer and hoping that it falls mostly on a weekend, right? I mean, that's kind of us in Minnesota. But anyway, um, in 2009, the Minnesota Vikings were hot like a pistol. It was fantastic. Things were going great because we sniped Brett Favre from the Green Bay Packers. He was in the twilight of his career. He was having a fairy tale season. It was going to be amazing. We were favored to win the Super Bowl. But in one of the most horribly rough playoff games in NFL history, we lost to the New Orleans Saints. And really, ESPN commentators today will say this was one of the most horribly rough games in NFL history. And what came out after the game, right after the game, there was this, this, this scandal called Bounty Gate that came out. And it turned out that the New Orleans Saints coaching staff was bribing and paying their players immense sums of money to injure Brett Favre on the field. And I got furious about this. I thought, man, this is just wrong. This isn't just cheating. This is criminal. You're paying people to break somebody's legs, to incapacitate them, to paralyze them. And I was mad. I was like really, really upset, right? And thank God that eight years later, the miracle in Minneapolis would happen and we'd have one of the greatest walk-off touchdowns in NFL history against the New Orleans Saints. Poetic justice. See you, Drew Brees. But anyway, um, <laughs> but who's counting? Who remembers stuff from that long ago? I don't hold grudges that long. But I was a huge NFL fan. Huge. You know what? After this experience, I just got disengaged. I didn't even care. Because the win used to be defined really clearly to me, but suddenly I felt like this game isn't really that winnable. I mean, the rules aren't really that enforced. And what is winning? They're moving the goalposts on us. Like, we had everything. All the boxes checked, but all of a sudden it doesn't even matter. I mean, Roger Goodell came out with one of the biggest slap-on-the-wrist punishments. I mean, their coaching staff should have been put in jail. They got suspended for four games in the next season and still got to continue through the playoffs. This is ridiculous. I just said, I'm done. I don't care. I'm officially a disengaged fan. I don't care anymore because the win is not clearly defined. As parents... It's our job to create a winnable environment for our kids and to define and articulate that win clearly to them. Do your kids and teenagers know what a win looks like for them in their life? You as a leader, it is your job to articulate that to them, but not just to have them understand it. You've got to say it, spray it, wheel it, deal it, and make them feel it. You want them to be passionate about the win like an NFL fan is about their team. 
My kids know what a win looks like. I'm doing the best I can. Now, my, my youngest two don't really know. I mean, Aurora, she doesn't even know what's happening. All she can do is look cute like a boss. And I look at her, I'm like, I made that. Hello. <laughs> yeah. The other day, I was in the supermarket with her, and somebody looked at me. And they said, are you the nanny? I was like, no, no, she's my daughter. She's a towhead. She's blonde hair, blue-eyed. People are like, how did that happen? Well, anyway, she's mine. Pretty sure. Right, Kristen? Right? Okay, just kidding. Um, <clears throat> my kids know what a win looks like. Number one, love Jesus with all their heart. Number two, marry a man who loves Jesus if they get married. I don't care if they stay single, but if they get married, I want them to love Jesus. Number three, I want them to love people and treat them the way that they want to be treated. And number four, get straight A's in school and be the best. I didn't say do your best. I said be the best. Okay, it's not that highest standard. It's just perfection. But anyway, um, my seven-year-old even knows what it means uh, to, to date a man who loves Jesus. I want her to be able to understand what that looks like, right? Love, she needs to find a man who loves Jesus in word and action. He doesn't just say he loves Jesus. I want him to live it out in his life. Number two, he needs to have a plan to provide for her well, okay? I tell Izzy, hey, you might say that money doesn't matter, but it does. Does he have a plan to provide for you? I'm not saying he's got to be rich. I just want like a million-dollar nest egg from the beginning. No, just kidding. Um, and uh, number three, does he have a vision for her life? Because I don't want him just to be successful. I want him to do something with their life that matters in eternity, Okay, those are my three standards, and Izzy, I know, can articulate that, because it's my job to define the win for her and it, articulate that to her. When you play a game without clearly defined rules, it's frustrating and pointless, isn't it? It's like, I don't even want to play anymore. I think that's why a lot of kids are disengaged from their family, especially as teenagers, right? You get these teenagers, and they're more passionate about their friends than they are about the family. Why? Because at home, you don't have clearly defined wins. With their friends, it's like, I know how to climb the social ladder. I know how to win at home. I have a really clearly defined. I know with video games, I mean, I can win on Fortnite, right? I just got to be the last man surviving before the vortex closes in on me. That's pretty easy. It's pretty simple to win in those contexts. You get kids who are disengaged at home because you're not articulating the win to them. When I see families that are really close with teenagers, what are the ones that are close? Families that are galvanized around a purpose. It might be pointless, but I see families that are close around sports. I see families that are close around um, a specific activity or, or, or whatever event. Um, I see families that are galvanized around serving Jesus. And those kids are more passionate about their family than they are about their friends. Why? Because their family has a win that is clearly defined and inspiring. I see a lot of parents who are frustrated and disengaged, and I think it's the same problem. You haven't defined a win. You forgot what a win looks like, right? So you get home, you say, well, I'm just going to put on SpongeBob and, you know, Paw Patrol and whatever. I'm going to paint my nails for three hours because I can't even, right? And it's like, yeah, because you forgot what the win looks like. I know of no other way to make parenting less fun than to forget what the win looks like. And here's the truth in America today. I feel like most parents are playing to not lose. That's your goal. I don't want my kid to get pregnant. I don't want my kid to get addicted to drugs. And I want my kid to graduate from high school and not fail. That's it. That's not inspiring at all. Playing to not lose, that's prevent defense. We yell at NFL coaches for playing that way, but we play the same way in our house. I want to not lose. It's way more fun to play to win. And I would tell you as a parent, it's your job to create an inspiring picture of what victory looks like. Spend some time today writing it out. I want some families to say, you know, we're going to galvanize our life around a purpose, around a calling, around a win. What does it look like for your kids to see God through your life? What does a win look like for your kids? And most importantly, do your kids know what that win looks like? You need to help them see it. The second thing that Jesus teaches us is to lead by example. I want my kids and teenagers to love Jesus. Who doesn't? I want my kids to treat others better than themselves. I want them to be generous. I want them to seek God's will ahead of their own, right? That's all fine. But here's a simple question. Do you do that in your life? Do you live this way? Our kids and teenagers, I think really, their demeanor and personality is just a caricature of our biggest faults and our biggest strengths. They're just a cartoon version of ourselves. If we want our kids to be selfless, it begins with modeling it. I think the biggest way kids learn to interact with each other is the way that we interact with our spouse at home. All the time, I have especially mothers, they come in my office with their kids, and they'll say like, eh, my, my kids just don't listen to me because my husband doesn't respect me at home, you know, and he's just the worst, and he's just a terrible human being, and blah, 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 with their kids right there. You know, Ephesians 5.21, it tells us we submit to one another, right? So your husband is your authority, and, and you know, your wife is your authority at the home. you got to respect each other. And if you are rebelling against your authority, which you're doing in my office, saying, you know, my husband's a jerk and I hate him, right? What are you doing? You're modeling for your kids what rebellion against authority looks like. So what do your kids do? They rebel against their authority, which is you right? You lead by example. I see parents all the time say, you know, I mean, my kids, you know, they, uh, they just won't overcome adversity. Yeah. Well, last time you had an issue in your garage, you chucked your socket wrench across the garage, it embedded itself in the wall, and you kicked the jack stands out from underneath your car. And you wonder why your son has a horrible, you know, mind-losing temper, because that's what you model for them. We lead by example. 
You know, last time you had an issue, it was ranting on Facebook, my life is just the worst and I can't even, blah, 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 blah. Why do your kids give up all the time? Because you do, right? We lead by example. If you want your kids to move themselves out of addiction and squalor, then you model it in your life. Lead by example. Leadership is not about what you say. It's about what you do. And I want you to take a moment to think about your example. Here's a question I ask myself all the time as a leader. Okay, when I lead our church, when I lead my house, my children, I ask myself this question. Would you be inspired by you, by your actions? If I was following me, would I find the way, the demeanor, the actions, the choices, the words, would I find that inspiring? Would I be selfless and courageous because of my own example? I think this is a critical question because a lot of times we're like, my kids won't listen to me. It's like, yeah, you wouldn't listen to you either if you acted like that, right? It's a big deal. Would you be inspired by you? When we have a leader that tells us to do something at work but then doesn't do it, isn't it, isn't it just so frustrating? They're like, you need to do this. And then they go and do the exact opposite. You're like, ah, you are just, you go into the break room and you're like, our leader says, can you believe it? He's just such a jerk. And then we go home and we treat our kids the exact same way. It's like, of course, of course, right? We're being, and anyway, this is a big one to me, okay? Once you get to the, would you be inspired by you? Once you're actually doing it, you need to help your kids see the why behind the what. This is so important. We are so strategic about this. We don't always do this. I mean, we fail at parenting. I want you to know, Kristen and I, we have normal household like everybody else. I think sometimes people are like, oh, it must be perfect being married to Kristen or being married to John. Listen, we fight for our marriage, let me tell you. Fight hard. But uh, before we leave in the evening, we have a lot of evening meetings. We ask our kids to pray with us for whomever we're meeting. Hey, come together. Mommy and dad are meeting this person. Can we pray that, that, that Jesus shows them his grace and mercy and they become Christians? Can we pray together? Can we pray that Jesus sets them free from addiction? Can we pray that Jesus will restore this person's marriage? I want my kids to see the why behind the what. I want them to see me modeling what it looks like to rely on Christ, okay? Um, and this isn't just because we're in ministry. I think all of us should be a part of this, no matter what you do in your life. The other day, Kristen was leading someone to Christ in the truck. And the kids were in the truck just absolutely losing their minds, okay? And Hermione, middle child in the back seat, was doing, Mom, 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 Mama, 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 Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. And then she went into horsey mode, Mom, Mom, you know, like, Woo, are you a horse? What's going on, right? And Izzy, I wasn't even mad at her. She turns around and she goes, Hermione, shut up. Mommy is weeding that weighty to Jesus. And I was like, praise God, she understands why. She understands why, like, we're winning, we're winning. I didn't get mad at her. When we get back from a trip, my kids will come to me and they'll say, hey, did, they get, did that lady we prayed for, did, did, did she give her life to Jesus? Did Jesus set them free? Did Jesus, I love that my kids know. When I go to church in the evening, I'll say, hey, kids, daddy's going to leave to the 6 p.m. service. Why am I going back to church? And they'll say, to tell people about Jesus. Why does that matter? Because God has commissioned all of us to bring the gospel to all the people of the earth, right? I want my kids to understand the why behind the what. I want you to help your kids in the same way. We have 800 active volunteers at this church on a monthly level. And that's exciting. That's great. I love that, okay? Um, when you go to volunteer here, I hope that you are praying with your families that God is going to use you. Because not only are you modeling for your kids what it looks like to rely on Jesus, but you're teaching your kids the why behind the what. Even if you don't volunteer here, which I'd love to have you part, be a part of our teams. It's fun. It's great. But even if you don't volunteer here, I hope that when you pull into our parking lot, before you get out of the car, you say a prayer to yourself to remind you of the why behind the what. Why am I here? Jesus, would you speak to my heart? Would you transform my family? Would you do a work in and through me because of this experience? Because we're not here to hear great music and a clever message. We're here to have the word of God transform our life. Remind yourself, remind your family of the why behind the what. Are we modeling things for our kids? Um, the other day, Kristen made a strategic decision to stop reading her digital Bible at home. Because uh, we realized a lot of times we'd be reading our Bible and our kids would just kind of scroll, think that we were scrolling on our phones. I vividly remember watching my dad read an analog Bible at home, an old fashioned with pages and stuff, right? And uh, I took this picture the other day because it was really, it just, it meant, it meant a lot to me to see my daughter sitting next to my wife highlighting and reading in her Bible. And she's seven years old, right? But when mom gets out and reads her Bible, why? Because Kristen is leading by example. She's showing Izzy, this is what, and do you want your kids to love and follow Jesus? Do you want your kids to have God be a priority in their life? Well, are you modeling it in your life, right? Because this is what that looks like. Lead by example. Third thing Jesus talks about is uh, to take ownership, to take ownership. I'm about to equip you with a phrase that is super important. It is the second most important leadership phrase that I know of. I use this phrase very often. Anybody who works for me or with me, my own family, they know I use this all the time. I'm going to equip it, equip you with it. It's super powerful. You should write this down. You're going to hate it when I show it to you, but the more you use it, the more you'll love it. This is my favorite phrase around. It's all my fault. I love, I love that phrase. That statement is so freeing. 
Because when it's all my fault, then I have the power to fix it. This is an empowering phrase. This phrase is an ownership phrase. This last Sunday, this last Sunday at the 6 p.m. service, we stumbled out of the starting gates with a muted microphone, and I was so mad. I was like, oh, you know, and I thought in my heart, it's not my fault. It's all David's fault. You know, he left that microphone muted and blah, 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 and, you know, he is a great volunteer, and David runs a great team. We're so grateful for him, and he makes our services so much better, and I just realized, man, what is my position right now? It's not my fault, right? And all of a sudden, I said, you know what? Wait a minute, wait a minute. I am in charge of this whole organization, and that's all my fault. This is my fault, right? So at staff meeting this week, I went to the team. I said, hey, I'm sorry that I have allowed our team to exist without a checklist for pre-service. We need to put something together so that this will never happen again. And it's my fault as a leader that I've allowed this to happen. Will you forgive me? And to be clear, Dave is great. Um, the, the volunteer who was running the soundboard was great. It really was my fault. I failed. It's my weakness as a leader to enforce something that would prevent that from happening again. It's an empowering phrase. And as a parent, I think so often we give our ownership away with the phrase, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. Yes, it is. God has anointed and appointed you as a leader of your life and your family. So own it. I want you to change that to, it's all my fault, and I'm going to find a way where there is none. I'm going to make it better. And if I have to get a chainsaw and blaze a new trail through the woods, that's what I'm going to do. I feel like especially with the more and more kids we have, especially when they get into their teenage years, you know, um, with our first kid, there's a reason why firstborn kids uh, make more money, have better marriages, and live longer. It's because we take ownership with our firstborn kids. And by the time we get, you know, to the second, third, we're like, eh, whatever, right? We just kind of let them go a little bit. Especially when our kids start to grow, I think we settle. We settle. We're like, yeah, we love Jesus. And, you know, I know she wants to go to her boyfriend's house and it's Saturday afternoon. And I know they've been sexually active, but do I really want to confront her? Do I really want to deal with the ranting and the, ugh, and all this? I mean, do I really? I mean, she's mostly, do I really want to deal with, I know the drinking and, you know, partying and stuff. Maybe I'll just buy the alcohol and let them come to my house because I want to just keep them safe, you know. And, uh. and what happens is we stop coaching and we start acting like one of the players. God didn't call you to be a player. He called you to be a leader, to be a coach. You lead your kids. Instead of trying to live through them, pick up your mantle of leadership and lead them. When we don't coach, this is what happens. Instead of the coach running the team, the players start running the team. You ever been a part of a team where the players run the team? What happens? The team loses. The team starts to lose. And that's what happens so often in our lives. We have this vision that we're working towards, and eventually we just stop taking ownership. And what happens? We start to lose as a unit, as a family. I think the best way to begin taking back ownership at home is to regularly and humbly apologize when you mess up. It's all my fault, and I'm sorry. The other day, um, I disciplined Isabel, and uh, she didn't see it, but I saw it in my own heart, and I know God saw it. I had anger in my heart when I disciplined her. And I had to go back to her. I said, hey, Izzy, will you forgive me for having a bad heart in that situation? I am so sorry. Is there anything that you need to hear me say to be assured of my love for you. I want to model for her. I want to lead by example what ownership looks like. Or hypothetically, if you're disciplining a teenager, maybe, hey, Billy, I realize that in my anger I gave you an irrational consequence. 50 days of grounding is a little excessive. And I love you and I care about you. And I'm sorry that in my zeal I removed your door from your room. I'm sorry um, in an unplanned way, okay? I'm sorry that I gave you a consequence without thinking about it. Will you forgive me? You model what humility looks like. Okay? And then I would tell you, if you do that, I, this is just a big deal. Parent as a committee. You and your spouse are a team. You and your co-parents, if you're divorced and you're in a co-parenting situation, you are a committee. And even though they might not be acting like teammates, you still go to them and you include them and you inspire them and you say, hey, this happened. Here's the consequence I'm thinking about. How do you feel about that? Right? You're building. Because I think so often parents go at it alone. It's like, hey, man, NFL teams, they're not coached by one single coach. Right? They have a whole staff, a coaching staff. You include everybody. Okay? Last point I want to make underneath this is um, don't get angry. The number one way to lose an argument is getting angry. I hate arguing with Kristen and getting angry because the second I get angry, it's like, oh, even though I'm right, even though all the points are on my side, I've now lost. And I, I need to kiss your shoe for the next two days because it's, oh, right? I hate getting angry. Same thing with kids. You know, with kids, though, if you get angry, you can let your anger dominate them, but I want you to know in the long run you're still losing ownership. Parents of teenagers, when your kids tell you something, this is my biggest statement for you. Don't get angry and don't freak out. You just sit there with your poker face. Ah, uh, okay, wow, two lines. Wow, that's crazy. Huh, who else was there? Hmm, that's interesting. And how did you feel about that? You listen, you let them finish, and if you are angry, do not, in your anger, give them a consequence. You wait until your heart is calm. You consult with your spouse, and then you go back and talk to them. 
If your default is anger with your kids when they share with you, your kids will stop sharing with you. I know so many parents, I've been a youth director for a decade, and you know what's funny to me? So many parents will come to me and they'll say, but my kids are so good. I mean, they're good kids. And I'm like, <laughs> no, they're not. Like, they're bad. They're real bad. But you don't know. Because when they were 11, you lost your relationship with them because your default was anger. Take ownership. Finally, last thing Jesus teaches us is to empower with feedback. Uh, my favorite leadership Quote, my favorite words as a leader, and everybody on our team, they might dread these words for me, but these are my favorite words. I use them all the time, is you decide. You decide. This is such an empowering phrase. The reason why we're able to succeed with such a small staff on such a small budget is because of these two words. I empower our team to use their own abilities. And you know what? Our team is so much better. I'm no longer the bottleneck. It was my weakness, my insecurities, my proclivities, and my struggles that stopped this organization from succeeding years ago. But when I started saying you decide, those two words really began to change things. Let me show you what happens when I use the you decide phrase. 50% of the time, they do what I would have done. And I'm like, you are a genius. That is a great idea idea. How did you, that idea is so good, right? 25% of the time they do better than I would have done. And I'm like, that's exactly what I was going to do. I love that idea. No, just kidding. I don't lie to them. Okay. And at 25% of the time they do something worse. They do something worse. But what I love about this whole process is 100% of the time I have the opportunity to equip, train, and empower them to be better. If I have a newer staff member who I'm developing really intensely, I will come to them before they've executed a decision that I've you decided them with. And I'll say, why are you deciding this way? And why is your choice better than the other options? Because I want to begin training them to think through the process. After the fact, especially if things go poorly, what I like to do is I, I'll say, what didn't you see ahead of time that caused you to choose incorrectly? And what could you have done to see that circumstance that you didn't see? And how are you going to learn from this in the future? Right? That's empowering. That's developing. And I do the exact same thing with my kids. Okay? I teach my kids and teenagers how to make great choices. And here's a big statement for a lot of parents. I want you to get this. Do not teach your kids what to do. This is a mistake that so many people make. Your job is not to train your kids what to do. Your job is to teach your kids how to think. This is so critical. So much of our parenting is built around this. I want to share with you guys a leadership story. This isn't how I act all the time. This is just one really big victory that I'm super proud of. I fail all the time. But um, when Isabel was five, okay, she was in kindergarten. She came to me one morning. She said, Dad, do I need a coat? Now, I've been laying a foundation for this conversation, so I was pumped up, right? This was strategic. She comes to me. She says, Dad, do I need a coat? I looked at her. I said, you decide, Izzy, right? She got a little scared. She was a little skittish. She didn't know what to answer. So I say, okay, I'll, I'll give you a hint. Okay, why do we wear coats? She said, because I don't want to be cold. I said, okay, so do you want to wear a coat? You decide. And then she said, is it going to be cold? And internally, I was like, yes, yes, she's learning to think, right? I don't want to teach her this when she's 15. Wear a coat, wear a coat. No, I don't want to. No, no, no. I want to teach her when she's five so I don't have to fight that battle when she's 15, right? So I say, okay, Izzy, how can we determine if it's cold or not? She says, well, we can look on your phone. I say, perfect. What's my phone say? She said, it's going to be 45 degrees today. That's a high. I said, is that cold enough to deem um, it worthy of wearing a coat? She said, yeah, absolutely. So I said, what are you going to do? She said, wear a coat. I'm going to wear a coat. And to be clear, I laid a foundation for this by letting her go to school without a coat. And I know my kindergarten teachers, they probably judged me. They thought, oh, that dad is just the worst. I'm never going to that first church. It's a terrible place. You know, I'm so happy where I go. That pastor is horrible, right? But I taught my daughter through love and logic. I want to teach her how to think, not just what to do. Because here's the truth. When she's five, the consequences are little. But when she's 25, in the middle of a snowstorm, she's going to think ahead and put a coat on instead of dying in a ditch, right? That's why I care about this. That's why this matters. For real, you want to teach your kids when the consequences are small, so that when they're older, they're not going to make decisions that they'll regret for the rest of their life. You want to teach your kids when the consequences are small so that when they stand before God in eternity, they will have prepared ahead of time by receiving the grace of Jesus in their life. Teach your kids what to think, not, or how to think, not what to do. So to summarize, Jesus says great leaders define the win. They lead by example. They take ownership, and they empower with feedback. And before we move on, I want to challenge you to pick one step here. Pick one step that you are going to take in your life. And don't put a number. I want you to specifically contextualize it and customize it to your life, okay? I'm going to lead by example. I tell my family to eat healthy, but I don't eat healthy. I'm going to make a change in my life in these ways. These foods are no longer welcome in my household. I want you to choose right now. I'm going to sit with my wife. We're going to define the win today after church. We're going to get 45 minutes alone. I'm going to drop the kids off at my parents' house. We're going to figure out what the win looks like. We're going to define. I actually want you to contextualize it. I want you to take ownership. 
If there's something in your life, I want you to go to your wife and say, hey, I am sorry that I have been placing responsibility on you for something that is my God-given responsibility. Will you forgive me? It is all my fault. I want us to actually take action on this. Church is not supposed to just be inspiring. It's supposed to be life-changing. So take action. I see so many of you just not writing. And you know what that does is that makes me want to retire. That's great. Okay? I'm done. I'm buying, I'm buying, a, I'm buying a place in Naples. See you guys. No, just kidding. Okay. I know I've given you a lot today as far as tips and tricks, but I want us to roar at this as a church. And some of you are not parents biologically or your kids are grown and you're an empty nester, but as Christians, we're parents to many. Jesus has entrusted us with the world to lead to him. And if you're part of this church, I know that in the last four years, we've seen close to 1,000 people choose to follow Jesus as their leader and forgiver. And uh, listen, there is a huge burden of leadership right here. God is waiting to use you. And if you don't feel like a leader, I've got good news for you, okay? One last thought um, before we move into the closing part of this message. Um, the United States Army recently completed a multi-million dollar study on what the, the key traits were of a leader. And they wanted to really find, like, what personality type do we want to find that can be a great leader? Multi-decade, multi-million, thousands of people study. And what they concluded was there wasn't a specific gene, there wasn't a specific stature, there wasn't a specific profile or personality that would make somebody a great leader which is really interesting because everybody fully expected that there would be. What they determined is the number one determiner of whether or not somebody will be a good leader is if they, in their heart, want to be a leader. If you want to be a great leader, you got to want it. you got to say, I want it. I want the mantle of leadership in my life. Listen, 18 years ago, I became a Christian, and I said, here I am, Lord. Use me. I was not someone that people would want to follow at the time. I was not somebody that people would classically associate with uh, as a leader. I didn't have lots of friends or influence. I struggled immensely in school. I had a learning disability. I mean, it was hard, but I wanted it. Because when I read the Bible, I just saw God using leaders, brave, audacious, courageous leaders to change the world. And I believe that following Jesus means stepping out into a position of leadership in your life, saying, I am going to be a culture maker. I am going to be a trailblazer. I'm going to make a way where there is no way. And I said, Jesus, I want to serve you. And even if that means leading, I want to do it. And look, there are a lot of times I feel intimidated as a father and as a pastor and a husband. But I want what God is calling me to. I want it. And I'm not going to sit in that old stuff. Jesus died for my sin and my fear, and I want that freedom. I want it. I want the mantle of leadership in my life. See, God's love is too great and his mercy is too complete for me to back away from that sort of thing. And to be clear, I'm afraid every day of failing, but this is what I love about Jesus, is I choose to roar at my fears and my insecurities. And what I do each morning is I give God, I actually give God my fears and insecurities. I say, Jesus, I give you my fear of failure. Jesus, I give you my fear of not being able to write another sermon this week. I mean, it's Monday morning, and I, I'm getting a panic attack, because what am I possibly going to tell you guys next week, right? I just give that to Jesus. I give God the inadequacy that I feel as a father and as a husband. I just give it to him. What I love is, is what Jesus does by the power of his spirit is he takes those things and he melts them down and he turns it into something effective for my good and for his glory. I think a lot of you would agree. One of the things that you love the most about coming to this church and me as a pastor is my weaknesses, right? I mean, that's the part that's really inspiring because you can see if God can take a messed up, insecure guy like me, he can do it in your life too with your brokenness and your struggle and your pain. And so every morning I give it to Jesus and I say, God, give me your strength and your call and your promises. You see, I just believe that I have a good shepherd and he is a good commander. And if God is for us, then who could stand against us? I want it. I'm taking it. And in the name of Jesus, I'm receiving it. I want to commission our church as leaders. And all of you, whether you have kids or not, you are a leader. But specifically, I want to commission parents in this church to step into leadership. And I want to ask you guys to stand in order to receive this commissioning. I know some of you are afraid of parenting. I know some of you feel helpless and unqualified like it's too late. My kids are already grown and gone, you know? My kids are gone, how can I do it? They don't love Jesus. Listen, I believe that is not what Jesus made you for. It is not too late. You can call your kids together and say, hey, for the last 10 years of my life, this is what the win looks like for us. You can take those insecurities and you can give those feelings to him. And I believe when you give them to Jesus by the power of his spirit, you can watch him turn those things into something powerful and purposeful. 
We serve a God who specializes in taking the foolish things and the shameful things and turning them into something beautiful. I want you to say, Jesus, use me. I know you can turn this mess into something amazing. I know there's a lot of you here today who'd say, John, you don't understand. I've got generations behind me of, of mess ups. I've got generations of brokenness. Listen, your mom and dad might have broken it, but in the name of Jesus, you can break the cycle. The power of God is in you. His spirit lives inside of you. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead can raise the brokenness in your life up from the grave. I want you to break the cycle of addiction. I want you to break the cycle for your children of divorce and desertion. I want mothers and fathers in this room to look at their sons and daughters and to pioneer a new path for them. I want us to say, Jesus, I'm believing for more for the next generation. I'm going to walk into it. I receive your call. I receive your mantle. I receive your anointing. And we may not know what's just ahead, but we know what's over the horizon because Jesus already told us the end of the story. Spoiler alert, he wins. He wins. So I want us to walk in that confidence. I want us to walk in that boldness. God, we want it. You got to want it. Say, Jesus, we want to lead our children. We want to lead our community. We want to lead our country into the calling you have for us. Let me pray for you. Jesus, in your powerful name, I commission the parents, the mothers, and the fathers of this church to be all that you call us to be. Give us boldness and courage to walk into the destiny and the promises you have for us. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen.